Okay, and welcome to the second week of our wonderful graphics class. Uh, and this, uh, this week we're going to cover a little bit more in terms of how you can actually make things uh, with a LightWave program. And the last week we introduced the um, basic interface and how it works, uh, particularly in Modeler. And this week we're going to talk more about how you can actually create things with it. Uh, because it's really important that we get started with this relatively quickly and that we can build on what we learn. Because LightWave is not an easy program to learn if you're trying to learn it too quickly. So we're going to take it step by step, and uh, it should be uh, easier than it looks on the surface. Now, this uh, lecture is going to cover primitives, layers, and surfaces, which are the nuts and bolts of the program. So without further ado, uh, we're going to talk about primitives. Now, primitives are in the LightWave program on your left-hand side in the Create tab. You see... Uh, those various uh, uh, shapes, the box, the ball, the cone, things like that, uh, those are primitives. Now, the reason they're called that is because in themselves, they aren't that interesting. But each one of those things uh, is designed to mimic a specific object. For example, if I just grab something here, uh, whatever this is, magic tape, what kind of primitive do you think you'd use to make this? A box, how about? Because it is a box. Pretty good, easily enough. However, let's say I pick up something like this and I'm looking at the, uh, at the lens here. Believe it or not, you could use a sphere to make this because it is slightly spherical. In fact, that may be the best approach. You could also perhaps use a disc, but not to get that curvature. And we'll talk about that as we go along. And to continue this, this could be a disc also because it's a cylinder. And it can even be hollow. You know, that's possible. And uh, I could do this all day. But uh, let's say you got a bottle. A bottle can be made using, using a disc. And that covers the, the basics of them. So pretty much any object that you want to create is usually going to start with something uh, that's relatively simple. Uh, and uh, what I would suggest, and this actually is a pet peeve of mine, Please don't create objects that are just primitives. You know, just putting primitives together, basically anyone can do that. You want to make something that's a little bit more intricate. Now, you, you, whether it's got more layers that you're putting together, something more than just the primitive itself, or, or it is something that you've modified in some way, even if it's all done with surfaces. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Now, before we uh, go on to primitives, uh, what I want you to understand is that you don't necessarily need them meaning that you can make any 3D object you want out of 2D polygons, and you can make any 2D polygon you want out of points. You can make an object from scratch from the very beginning. In fact, sometimes that's the best way to do it. But I would argue that most of the time, most objects that you're going to want to create, uh, you would save yourself a great deal of time by starting with a primitive that basically had the same characteristics. So don't make objects this way if you don't have to. Primitives are a lot easier. Basically, I just said that. Now, primitives are pre-made objects that can be made into other objects. Obviously, we've already covered that. Uh, the numeric pad is particularly useful. You have the ability uh, to take any object and uh, make it any dimensions that you want, any size. And you can do that on the numeric pad before you're finished with it. Or you can select... Uh, some of the, some or all of the points, and modify it in the program. And of course, there are many primitives to choose from. Now, if we were to go through some of these, uh, the first primitive that you're going to see is the ball or the sphere. And so that would be something that would essentially create a uh, you know, a, a ball, you know, a marble, that, that sort of thing. So as we uh, described in class and probably in the lecture material, a circle is a series of points that trace around a center point. Or a sphere would just take that into three dimensions, so it would trace around the center point in every possible uh, configuration. Now, in, in practice, when you're making a sphere in LightWave or any other 3D program, what you're really doing is taking a lot of, uh, of planes and kind of folding them around each other until so you created something that kind of resembles a volleyball. I think volleyballs are the ones, and I may be wrong about this, but volleyballs are the ones that have the geometrical shapes. 
that kind of make up the ball. So that's kind of what you're doing. And the more of those geometrical shapes, the smoother the surface of the ball will become. Uh, but a ball uh, can become anything round. Now understand that it doesn't have to be a perfect sphere. That's, that's a, a mistake that you can easily get yourself into. Uh, if you're doing a marble, then that probably would be a perfect sphere. Or if you're doing you know, something that's supposed to be that way, like a, 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 a crystal ball that someone's looking into. If it has to be perfect sphere, you can make it a perfect sphere. But the Earth is not a perfect sphere. That's because the Earth rotates, and the North and the South Pole are a little bit flatter than the edges. And so uh, the Earth kind of has like a hula hoop thing going on. And so if you were going to make a planet uh, you probably wouldn't make it quite perfect. In fact, you would deliberately distort it to some degree. Uh, and the same thing if you were going to make a shape, like, for example, one of those, uh, like an Advil pill. You know, those, those pills, kind of like a sphere that got flattened a little bit, if you can imagine that. Uh, that's something else that you could make using the sphere tool. And uh, I keep on getting ahead of myself. An egg would be another example, though. Uh, you can take a, if you want to make an egg, you can start with a sphere because if you look at the bottom of an egg, that looks very spherical. And then you can gradually pull it out uh, to get that smaller, that uh, the kind of more cone-shaped part of the top. And we may demonstrate that. Okay, and again, the numeric pad is uh, really good at establishing these dimensions. And uh, you can modify these using, using the modification pad, which we'll talk about. And all of that becomes possible. Now, the box is a little easier because basically almost anything uh, that's flat is going to wind up being a box. So a plank would really be a box. You use the box tool for that. Uh, or even a stick of gum or a noodle or something like that. So anything like that would be you use the box tool. It's basically a no-brainer. Uh, you also, uh, it assumes that the box has an interior and exterior. Uh, most of the time when you're using the box tool, and really make most of these other primitives, you're going to be thinking of the surfaces as opaque. You're not going to want to look through them, but you can if you need to. You can always change that, which we'll get into. Uh, boxes can also have rounded edges. Now, that's one of the little secrets. That's one of the only primitives that you can put a rounded edge on. It. Uh, it's actually a lot harder to do that uh, with some of the other primitives, and I'll demonstrate that as well. Okay, a disc is awfully useful because a disc allows you, first of all, a disc is a coin, you can make a coin, uh, that's, uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, but you could also make a can, a cylindrical can, by just stretching the disc. And from there, you can, if you stretch it and put a bend in it, you got a cord or a candy cane or something like that. So uh, it's a very versatile primitive, cylinders, discs, cans, candy canes, pipes, cords, those are all discs. And uh, the toroid, I put that up there because it's, it's one of the few obscure ones that does come up now and then. Because many of you are saying, what the heck is a toroid? I didn't know what a toroid was either. It's sometimes called a torus. A toroid is a donut shape. And uh, you can only use the numeric pad to make the toroid because it, it just doesn't, you don't draw it like you do the other ones. You actually, it just appears. And so if you want to make it different, you've got to actually manipulate it and the numeric pad, and it can be some trial and error. It's not easy to make toroids, but they are useful. And uh, great for rings and uh, things like that. Anything that's got a hollow center, like a belt maybe, or something along those lines, every once in a while that comes out. Okay, so here we are again in the light wave interface. Now I wanted to show you a couple of things that maybe didn't quite come up in the lab session. So I'm going to start with a box because it's the easiest one to work with. I'm going to turn on the box over here. Now you see that's under the Create tab. The Create tab gives you all of these things. When you change tabs, a lot of these things change too. So we're going to go with the box on the Create tab. And I'm going to use this upper area here. And I'm just going to left-hand click and drag uh, that initial part of the box. Okay, so that's our initial box there. Then I'm going to go down here, and I'm just going to pull it down a little bit. Now we have a three-dimensional shape. And so remember, uh, while we have the, uh, the numeric, or we have the box lit up, we can edit this. Now, the moment you turn off the box, you can no longer edit the box as a box. You have to edit using the, uh, the, the lines, the points, and the polygons. And so 
as long as that box icon is still there, you're fine. Now, if I click somewhere out here, I can accidentally create a second box. So if I were to do this, for example, well, that time it didn't work. So yeah, I'm wrong there. Uh, but uh, if you turn off box or get out of box mode for one reason or another, uh, you can be in a position where you can lose all your work. If well, not, that that's that much work. Now I go over here, and as I said, if you go over to a little rotate thing, you can then look all around this box in 3D space, and everybody's happy and having a good time. Uh, now here is one of the things that uh, um, is good to know ahead of time. So if I go into my numeric pad, now if you look down here, you can see numeric down here. And if I click on that, I get numeric, or I can just hit the N key on the keyboard. Now, if you look at, uh, at the box, one of the things that you're going to notice is that all of the angles are 90 degrees. This box, if it existed in the real world, would be razor sharp. In fact, if you tried to pick it up, you would probably cut your fingers. And so, uh, we normally wouldn't want to have a shape that's that razor sharp. And so there are ways of, of blunting it a little bit. One of the most amazingly easy things they've given you in this program is this little bitty tiny section here. So if you look up here, you got the width, you got the height, and you got the depth. So you can put in all those dimensions. And if you were making something and you had the dimensions, you could just enter them in, and there it is. And of course, you can also you can position it on the uh, on the window by by put zeros and all of those things. It will just line it up nicely with the um, with the center of everything. So therefore, as you can see, if I spin this, it's spinning along that center axis now. But if I were to go to radius, uh, which I would not have chosen that name for it, but eh, I didn't write the program. If I drag this to the right, you'll notice something happens. You see what happens? I can literally turn that box into kind of a pill. Or let's just say I bring it out here a little bit so I don't want to do too much to it. So I've, I've added, with a box, I've added kind of like a beveled edge to it. And you might say, well, that's cool, but I wanted it to be more fuzzy. I wanted to have more geometry. So you can go here under radius segments, and you can ramp up the segments. And it doesn't even take very many segments to create a very smooth edge. Now, let me tell you why that's important, among other things, uh, is that if you were to attempt to 3D print this, as long as the geometry is real, as long as you actually have those, those segments, it will print that as a curve. If you don't do that, let's say you have this, and let's say you're looking at it in, in layout and you have turned on uh, smoothing, the smoothing function, it's going to blur all this. We'll, we'll show you what that is in a little bit. But what I'm saying is the 3D printer, left to its own devices, will print everything with angular pieces. And so this is one of the few ways you can print off a nice smooth curve on the 3D printer without doing a lot of extra work. Okay, so there it is. So that can be your box. Now I'm going to leave it like this. I'm going to turn off box, and I'm going to turn off my numeric pad. And what I wanted to show you is something that's another one of those little annoying features uh, that comes up in, in a program, like any program does. Now remember, I'm going to stay in point mode. So I'm going to select some points. And so I'm going to select the corner points. Now there's a lot of points because each, in order to create that nice smooth geometry, it had to fill in by making a lot of little points and a lot of little lines. And so I'm only going to grab one. So I've highlighted there. I'm then going to select away the other ones by just right hand clicking and drawing a circle around them. And um, remember that if I if I right hand click again, I can't reselect them unless I hit the shift key on the keyboard. So if I hit the shift key, I can then reselect them. And there I've actually made things worse. So I'm going to deselect them now. And uh, well, no, that was wrong. Yeah, so I've only got one selected. All right, now here's the thing. Let's say I go to the modify tab, which is the second tab up here, I hit on that. And I hit move, which is the easiest one. If I were to move this, 
you can see what it does to the shape. What I'm doing is I'm bending, I'm bending that, which it isn't going to bend very well because I haven't given enough geometry to bend it. But this is okay for now. We'll talk about geometry more later. But let's say I move that back a little bit. So let's say, or I, let's say I just I just undo it. Control Z, Control Z. All right, so uh, there I've moved only that corner. Now I'm going to show you something. First of all, if I turn move off, because I can't deselect anything if move is turned on. Let's say I do that and I go back to move. If I have nothing selected at all, everything is selected. That's important to understand. If you select nothing, you're really selecting everything. And so if you apply something to everything, that can make a horrible mess very quickly, depending on what you're applying. So just so you understand, there are some things where you really only want to apply to small things. Okay, so for example, let's say we go back to this, turn move off. And let's say I do that thing again, and I only take one of these corners. Let's say I have that selected, and I go to rotate. And let's say I rotate that. Look what that does. It makes a horrible mess very quickly. But let's say I rotate it a little bit that way and a little bit that way. You know, maybe I can get away with some of that. So there, I'm effectively distorting that pretty badly. So if I undo that, I can put that back. But the point is that if I turn off rotate and I release those points, now rotate would rotate the entire object. And it could be that's that's what I want to do. Now notice I'm only able to rotate it on the axis that I'm currently on. So if I'm on this axis, I'm rotating it, I'm kind of spinning it from above. If I'm down here, let's stretch that back about. If I'm down here. Now you see I'm kind of making it go up and down like, a, like it's going over waves. And if I go to this side here, I'm rotating it like that. And so and this will affect how the object operates from there on in. If I want to leave it like that, you know, then I got to live with that later on. And so sometimes you simply don't want to do that. You want to keep it nice and, and normal. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit more on basic... Uh, rotation, basic geometry, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and there's other things you can do as well. Uh, one more thing I'll show you on this one because I think we kind of need to. If I were to try to bend this, I know for a fact it isn't going to work. Now, first of all, let's see what happens if I try. You see, immediately it, it, goes in, it goes nuts. Now, there I think I've almost gotten away with it, but I haven't really bent it. That's not what bend is supposed to do. So if I undo that, if I try to bend it this way, then basically it doesn't work either. It just kind of looks like a pencil eraser now. But let me show you where that actually would help. So I'm going to turn off bend, and I'm going to go to another window. And here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to create another box. I'm not even going to make it as complicated. Well, actually, it's almost the same box. And so we'll just start with that box. And this one, I'm going to go to my numeric pad, and I'm going to add some, some segments to it. Now, really, I don't have to add that many segments, but in this case, I'm going to, and I'll explain why. Because I want to be able to distort this more than, more than I've just done. So I'm going to turn off magnetic pad, and I'm going to turn off my box. Now this, I'm not, I've selected none of it, so it's selected all of it. I'm going to go into Modify, I'm going to go back to Bend, and this time, look what happens. Wow, look at that, you see? I can bend this. How's that, huh? So you see what you can do? And so I can even bend it a second time, so I can make a shape like that. And so you can see already the kind of creativity you've got with this. Whereas, and then let me tell you the reason why that's important. Uh, because if you have a plane, if you have a two-dimensional plane, by its very definition, you can't bend it. It's, a, it's, it's in one dimension. So in order to bend it at all, you basically are bending the universe. And so light wave will allow you to get away with that a little bit, but it, it's, after a certain point, it just doesn't work. And so uh, if you have an object that you want to be able to bend, you want to have it so that it can bend 
those individual planes in relation to each other to give you those effects. And so that's how that's done. Okay, parts and components. Most objects contain more than one component. Uh, the objects we've been playing with now are basically nothing but primitives. They don't do anything yet. Uh, but if you're going to make something that you're actually going to use, uh, chances are it's going to have more than one component. Even if you're talking about text, let's say you have a logo. Usually that's at least made up of more than one letter. And you can have a, a, a car as an object if you're making a car. Uh, and if you have wheels, the wheels are usually going to be a separate component. So the car could start out as a box or a rectangle, and you can add discs, which would be wheels to that, and have it drive around. Uh, layers allow you to independently edit components. And so if you have one component on one layer, another component on another layer, you can have them move in relation to each other. Uh, and that will save you enormous amounts of aggravation. If you try to edit everything in one layer, uh, you will drive yourself insane very quickly. I know I've done it. Uh, layers can be moved separately from other layers, and there's no limit to the number of layers you can have, uh, which can be a little bit confusing because you can have hundreds of layers and it can take you time to find the right one, but in fact, they do work. Now, the background layer, uh, which is where you hit the little triangle there, allows you to, uh, to select things uh, in the background and move them around. And background layers can also allow you to transform or modify other layers. Okay, so here we are back in, in Modeler again. And what I'm going to do, just for fun, I'm going to keep this wonderful shape that I've made because I actually am, am impressed with that. And so I'm going to say that that is somehow part of some larger object. And so I'm going to do something with this. And I'm sort of playing it by ear here, but I'm going to have some fun. And the first thing I want to do is I want to close that shape. So if I'm looking at it this way, I want to have it turn into like a circle with the center in it. I'm not sure why I want to do that, but I do. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, uh, first of all, let's do some housekeeping. I'm going to go back to layer one. And let's say I'm done with this layer. I'm just going to delete that. And so here again, if you don't select anything, oops, what did I do? Turn off Ben. Ben was turned on by accident. Okay, so I hit the delete button. If nothing was selected, everything was selected. So this layer is now empty. Now you'll notice if you look in the layers panel, you see that little bitty white dot up there. Uh, in layer two, that means there's something in it. That does Layer one does not have a white dot. That means layer one is empty. But I'm going to put something in layer one. So what I want to do is I want to copy this whole thing and put another copy of it in the second layer or in the first layer. So to do that, I have to be in polygon mode. Now, I know it's crazy, but if I selected all the points, it would actually leave the polygons behind. So I would just have a bunch of points. So I'm going to go into polygon mode instead. Uh, edge mode wouldn't do anything useful here. I am just going to draw around the entire box uh, because uh, that's, that's the easiest way. That way I know it's all selected. And I'm just going to go to copy. Then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go back to layer one. And I'm going to hit the bottom little tab there, and I'm going to put layer two into the background. So you can see this is, this is the original layer. And if I hit edit paste, you'll see that now my second object has appeared over the first. So now if I hit move, because now I'm in layer one, you can see what I can do. I can now move that aside. So here's what I want to do. I want to flip it around so that it's, uh, it's the other way. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to do it as part of the translate menu. That allows you to do all your moving and things like that. And so I'm just going to go down to where it says more because apparently it doesn't, it doesn't keep this. I'm just going to go ahead and flip it. And so what access do I flip it on? Well, that's a good question. I want to flip it from this point of view, I think. It may not be exact, but I'll, I'll get started. So I'm thinking I want to use the, uh, the z-axis. Boom. And so did it work? Well, kind of. It's close enough. But this is actually kind of useful to us. So there, I may have chosen the wrong axis. I may not have. So now I'm just going to go to move. And I'm going to move this over here like that. Now notice from this point of view, it looks correct. 
What does it look like up here? It looks all wrong because it is not correctly positioned. So now if I want to have that close together, let's say I move this over here like that. Now I can see that uh, something else is wrong. I'm going to go ahead and rotate that this way. And I'm, I know I'm kind of doing it by guessing by gosh here, but I'm almost there, I think. So if I were to look at this, what is it looking? Yeah, that's just about ready. And so here, believe it or not, it's looking at this from the side. It sees those as the same thing. And so here, if I go to rotate, let's see if I can, yeah, that's better. Yeah, so it's rotating a little bit better. So I can rotate that against that. And so there, what I've got is the final product of this weird thing, whatever this is. So now I have this shape that is kind of like a, kind of like a pegboard or something like that, or a weird type of component. And so what I want to do is I want to put like a, some sort of a control in there. So let's say that this looks like some kind of a trackball. So what if I wanted to put a sphere there as something that, that, that you would, uh, you know, maybe like a, well, let's say this is a webcam or something like that. So it needs a sphere. So I go up here and then I turn on both of these. Now I hold on the shift key. I can turn on both of the other menus and there we are. So then if I go back to create, I can create a ball and let's say I do that and you can even move it so position it a little bit and so that becomes some sort of a spherical device or something like that and so that if I turn on all the layers I get something like this. Now, I don't know what that is, but it works. It looks like something you'd find on a modern desk for some reason. You know, whether it's uh, something you use to, to wet stamps with or something like that, or some electronic device, a type of button or something like that. But whatever it is, I like it, so I'm going to keep it. Okay, surfaces. Surfaces are what allows the object to look real. So every object has at least one surface. And so if you don't create a surface for the object, uh, LightWave gives you what it calls a default surface. Now I urge you, as someone who's been there, please use surfaces skillfully. Uh, don't rely on the default surface because what will happen eventually is you're gonna wanna make something one color and something else another color and you find that you've used the default surface and so everything turns into the same color. And so then you wanna rename the surface and then you need some other thing was using the wrong surface name. It just gets confusing. So if you if you create a surface every time you know you're going to need one, you'll save yourself some time. Okay, surfaces determine how the object will respond to light. And I'll show you that in some detail. Surfaces also determine the color of the object or the component. An object can have many distinct surfaces. You know, you can have, like, for example, if you've got an automobile, you've got the rubber tires, which is a very different surface than the windows, which is different than the chrome finish, which is different than the paint, all those different things. And surfaces require the object to be viewed in layout. Modeler is very limited when it comes to surfaces. You can create surfaces and identify them in Modeler, but you really can't appreciate them until you put them into layout. Layout is the other half of the LightWave program. In layout, you determine what the audience sees. So essentially, layout creates your studio space, and in there, you've got your uh, you've got your scene. So your objects form the scene. Scenes can include lighting and camera characteristics, and many objects, lights and cameras. You can have some scenes that are incredibly elaborate and that can take up a lot of computer resources. Uh, at the same time, they can be beautiful. And so that's what I'm going to at least begin to demonstrate now. Okay, so let's get back to this. Let's say that I want to do something with this. Now, automatically, I know uh, that I've got some issues I'm going to want to take care of. Now, the first of the uh, issues is I'm going to go here. I'm just going to go right to this one layer. So that's one piece. I'm going to make that a separate surface than everything else. 
So I'm still in polygon mode. I'm going to select every polygon. Then I'm going to go down here to where it says change surface down here. And I'm going to hit that. And all I'm going to do is call this, as so I'm looking at from the back, I'm going to call this left underscore side, left side. And that's all I'm going to do. And so now it doesn't look like anything's happened, but now we have more than one surface. And I'm going to go to this one. I'm also going to select every polygon, and I'm going to go to change surface, and I'm going to call that one. I can just uh, go ahead and go from left side to right side, and hit OK, and there it is. And the last surface is this, so I will grab all those polygons, and I'm going to call that lens. And if I hit OK, there it is. Now here is where it gets fun. I am going to save the object, which uh, oddly enough, I haven't saved it yet. Very bad thing to do, not saving objects. So in this particular case, I'm going to save it in a folder. And I'm actually going to make a folder that I'm just going to call objects. And I do that so that we can basically understand that you want to keep track of where your stuff is, because if it gets lost, it can get really lost. So I'm going to call this thing, even though that's kind of a dumb name. We'll go with it anyway. So I've saved thing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to layout, which is a completely different program. Now layout looks uglier than modeler when you first get into it. And one of the things that you got to do first is it comes up with probably the, the least interesting view you've got, which is camera view. It's, it's a useful view, but when you first start, you don't want to be in that view. So I'm going to click down there, I'm going to change it to perspective view. Perspective view, now, now you see you have what effectively is a grid pattern where you can see what you're doing. So you're going to notice two elements here already. You've got a light, which is the only one. This is the light you're given. And you've got your camera. You can add more of these things all the time. But right now we're just going to keep it real simple. We're not even going to put a floor in the studio. So basically this is somewhere out in outer space. And I'm going to load an object. So if I go to File, Load Object, there's Thing. As long as you're using the program with the other program, it should find this stuff. And there is Thing. And so Thing has appeared in front of the camera. Now, you'll notice it looks a little different than it did in Modeler because now the surface is actually responding. Now, Thing is backwards, in my opinion. So what I want to do is I want to rotate Thing. Now, one of the things that you will notice about Thing is that Thing comes in three things. It's three surfaces, or three uh, pieces. And so, if I were to grab this, now right now, I see not it's moving just one of the things. And so that's a little bit of a problem. So I'm going to fix that uh, by going to this little trick here. If you'll notice here, this little bitty tiny thing, they've done everything possible to make this invisible. This little bitty box, if I hit that, I can see all the layers. But what I want to do now is I just want to select all of them. So I'm just going to select the first layer, hold down the shift key and select the last layer. And we've got layers. Now, uh, just to show you, if I go back into Modeler for a second, and I go here and I go to Window, and I go to the uh, Layers panel, you'll see for a thing, I've got three layers. So let's say I'm going to name them for the heck of it. I just double click on that. I'm going to call that left, and this one, I'm going to call that right, and this one, lens. So if I've done that, and then I go back to, uh, to there, and so I'm just going to reopen this, this file. Or actually, first I'll save this, save object. And then if I go back here, You'll notice that uh, if you look at these, I still got them as layer one and two. Okay. So this is an exercise in how irritating a program can be. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into items here, and I'm going to clear all objects, and then I'm just going to load it again. Uh, load, load object thing, 
And there it is. And this time it's got the proper names. So if I were to go here and I were to select all three, now if I move them, they all move. And this is going to be very useful when we get into other things. I'm also going to go into Modify, Rotate. And here we rotate it with rings. And so there's the, the, you get the yellow ring, I mean the, the blue ring, the red ring, and the green ring. And all I'm doing now is just moving this so that the camera can get a good look at it. And so then if I move to camera view, now we're in perspective, we can see it's like being inside the studio looking down from a balcony. So if I were to hit this and go to camera view, and there's only one camera, that's what the camera sees. So let's stick with that just for a minute, because I'm just going to go through the surfaces part. Now, right now, this thing, it doesn't look very realistic. In fact, it doesn't look very useful. So if I go to surface editor, I get this window here. Now notice we've created those surfaces, left side, right side, and lens. And so I'm going to start with the left side, which is probably going to be this. Now, let's say I want to change color. I can choose kind of a light blue, which I don't Well, We'll start with that, see what that does. So that becomes a light blue. And apparently it's, it's inverted itself. So that's the really, from my perspective, I call that the right side, but that's okay. So let's say the other one, we'll just select the color. And let's say we want to make that kind of a, kind of a, a pink color. And let's say right now the lens, we want the lens to be what color? Want the lens to be maybe like a green. I don't know why we'd want to do that, but let's pretend that we do. Okay, so we've got our object there. Now, let's start with the lens. Notice how the lens looks like the front end of a zeppelin. You're seeing all of those polygons. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go hit the word smoothing. Now notice the lens has to be highlighted. Smoothing is unchecked. I'm going to check smoothing, and suddenly lens gets nice and smooth. Now, while I'm at it, you don't always have to do this, but I'm just going to hit smoothing on the other ones too. It doesn't affect those as much, but it does make them a little better. Okay, so let's say I go to the left side now, which I know is blue. Let's say I want to make that look shiny. And you get a lot of controls here, and, and uh, you're going to see that you can do amazing things with this. So I got my color established, and luminosity is how, how much light it gives off if you want to make it a light source, which we'll talk about that. Specularity. Specularity is how what the highlights look like. So if I bring specularity up, you'll see that we suddenly get this highlight. I can even make it glossy so it has like a plasticky look. And I can even make it reflect. So let's say I turn up reflection so it'll act like a mirror. And let's say that that's what I want to do. Now I'm going to show you one other setting here which is incredibly useful. If you look at the top here right next to where it says camera view, you get textured solid. This, uh, this setting, this view setting, allows you to view it in what is called VPR, or Virtual Progressive Render. When you do that, it will give you a real-time look at what the surfaces are doing in terms of the reflections. So you can see that nice little highlight there. So let's say I turn the glossiness down a little bit. You can see that I can make that more like an aluminum finish. Actually, it looks a little better that way. And let's say I go to my right side, and I will give that some specularity too. So it's got that look, maybe a little bit of glossiness. So something along those lines, give it some reflection. Now notice what happens when I do reflection. You begin to see the other objects reflected there. So let's say I go to lens, and lens, I'm going to start with that specularity. We'll make it a like a glassy type surface. So I'll make that really glossy so it's like a marble. And if I turn up reflection, we're going to get that. And so maybe we don't want that much of that. I can de uh, emphasize it a little bit. What if I wanted to make it look like that was a lens? If I turn up transparency, 
I can begin to see through it. Now there we run into a little bit of a problem because this doesn't really look like a lens because a lens has internal reflections. So there, in order to make it look natural, I want to turn on double-sided. So now, if I turn on transparency or turn it up a little bit, transparency, you can see we can, we can get a little bit more of that. And so here we have kind of like this, this glass ball in the middle of there. And of course, if we decide to give it a refraction index, we can make it, we can make it act like a lens. So you can do things like that. And so let's say that that is enough for now. So we've got ourselves a little bitty tiny scene. So I'm going to turn off this. And from here, I want to render this out. And to do that, I have to hit the, uh, the F9 button on the keyboard. So if I hit F9, you see that it renders that object. Now, it has rendered a very low resolution version of this, which is perfectly all right for now because it didn't take it very long to do it. So there is my object, and so I'm just gonna hit continue. Now, I have a picture of that object, a picture. So I'm going to save this. I'm gonna go here, save RGB. So it's the very first thing up there. And I'm gonna save it, and this is scary. You got all these different formats, and really very few of them you ever use. So I'm going to save it as a PNG 32. PNG is a type of bitmap, and 32 bits allows you to have a transparent background. So I'm going to put it right here, and I'm going to call this thing underscore picture. And if I hit save, there it is. So if I want to look at that, if I were to go and find it, thing underscore picture, and if I were to open that with, say open with, I'm just going to go with photos. And so there is my completed picture. Now the important thing to understand about this is you can send this to your client. So put it in an email, say, what do you think? And the client will say, what the hell is that? And that's how that goes. Okay, so that's basically the idea. That's where we're ending up here. And so my hope is that you will experiment with these things. And what I've just demonstrated is the basic workflow. Where you start in Modeler, work your way into layout, and then ultimately render out to a 2D expression of your 3D object. And whenever I ask for an assignment, that's how you have to send it to me. Okay, so we will add more detail to this as we go on.